in telling the story, Jesus says, the groom is delayed. I don't know if you've ever been to a wedding, but when the groom is late, not a good thing. Just ask the bride or the guests. I'm sure that all of us have been delayed at one point or time. Maybe you've been at O'Hare and you've watched your flight, which was supposed to leave at 6 a.m. Now it's delayed till 8 a.m. There's ice on the runway or there's too much heavy traffic coming in or they're the one I don't like most of all. They're working on the plane you're about to fly on. That always gives a confident feeling. But as the hours continue to get delayed, all of us kind of are thinking, on the other end of that flight path is all the things, whether for business or for vacation, that we had scheduled that are getting missed. I'm going to miss that meeting. I'm going to miss my car, my arrangements, and that time will never be regained. It's lost to what we had planned. Or going to the doctor's office and being delayed in seeing the doctor and in waiting while people are sneezing and coughing and you're, you're thinking, if I wasn't sick before seeing the doctor, I'm surely going to get sick now. Or they give you a date. We're going we're gonna to give you test results on Monday and now it's Wednesday and you're calling every day. They said there was something suspicious. Well, what does that mean? Uh, when am I going to know something definitively? Waiting is tough. Being delayed is difficult. Being in the ER and being delayed from seeing a doctor or getting a bed by hours, anytime we're delayed, or for that matter, election results, delayed, usually we're used to that being in a 24 cycle, but now what's going on in Nevada? I mean, they still don't have results. North Carolina delays and we get impatient. We get upset. Some of us get angry. We get discouraged. We get anxious. Why hasn't it happened yet? We're so used to having things on our schedule at our time, especially today, when we want it as we have demanded it, that when something is delayed, it makes us upset. Now, in the first century, as Jesus has just gotten done talking to the disciples about the coming of the end of the age, something we often refer to as the second coming of Christ, and the early church is hearing these stories, these parables that Jesus is telling. There's a wedding and the groom is delayed. Now let me put this into perspective. The initial disciples, the men and women that Jesus knew, had heard him say things like, some of you will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with the angelic hosts to return. And they said, didn't he say he's coming? And now, 30 years later, Jerusalem is burning. The zealots have risen up in open revolt against Rome. The Romans have come in with uh, Titus and, and Vespasian. They've killed over half the men of, of the city of Jerusalem. Their, their town lays in waste. There is no temple. You see the sacrilege of the desolation of the temple. Well, it's gone. And we're still waiting. And you see this progression in the writings of the New Testament. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 7, says, are you planning on getting married? Hold off, because the time is short. The coming is imminent. He might be here any minute. So I know you want to get married, but put it off, because Jesus is going to return. And then later, in 1 Thessalonians, just a few years or a decade later, the people of Thessalonians say, when we started this journey, we had brothers and sisters who were here at the beginning, who were following Christ as the Messiah. Now some of them have died. Now if Jesus comes back, what's going to happen? Is, are we going to go together? Are they going to join us in this rising up? How does that work? And you hear uh, Paul talk about Jesus meeting those who are alive in the clouds, and Jesus also being with those who have died trying to work through this problem of when is Jesus coming back? And finally, late in the New Testament, in 2 Peter, they say, where are the promises of his coming? 2 Peter 4. 
because nothing has changed between humanity and God since the beginning of creation to now, he's still not here, which leads the writer of 2 Peter to say, remember, a day in the Lord's time is like a thousand years. I say, okay, all right, long haul. But now we've been one millennium, two millennium. Now we're starting the third thousand years. So how many days is it till he's coming back? The great Lutheran and late Lutheran theologian Paul Tillich said, you know, it, as we see these discussions of Jesus with the disciples and, and also in books, apocalyptic writings like Revelation or Daniel, we see all these symbols, uh, seven-headed beasts and dragons and the sky being dark, the sun and the moon being darkened and the stars falling from the sky and there's and 10 bridesmaids. We have all these symbols which to the first century church might have had deeper allegorical meaning that made specific sense to them but for us maybe in some ways broken symbols because we don't know all of the history and all of the connections that the first church, first group of Christians or Jesus followers might have had but he says that all of these images, these eschatological or these end time images, these second coming images All of them have to do with having patience, giving a strain of hope that transcends the limitations that we face in current circumstances. When the reality of present human suffering meets the hope and mystery of the divine promises. So that whatever we are facing, whether it's pandemic or national division, Thomas Long puts it another way. It's as if the church realizes that they're in it for the long haul and they know there will be wars and rumors of the wars, famines and floods. They know that they are going to have some front row seats to some pretty grim realities as disciples. Some of them will get martyred. Some of them will be persecuted. There'll be some pretty terrible things we witness in the world that happen. Some terribly, horribly unjust things that happen to brothers or sisters within the church and outside of it. That we say, this is not what the kingdom looks like. These are not the fruits of the kingdom. And instead of throwing up our hands in despair and saying, why or woe is us, the message that Jesus is saying, stay vigilant, stay on track, be in it for the long haul because at the end the promises of God are true. But that's a struggle because I find that as Christians often hear these parables or stories or um, apocalyptic writings of Jesus, they usually react in one of two ways. One is to prognosticate, okay, uh, the birth pangs are going to be, there's going to be wars and rumors of the war. Okay, so there was desert storm in Iraq, and there's a, a war in Sudan, and there's, uh, let's see, and this person's the president, and there's a blood moon out this cycle. So uh, Jesus is going to come back, you know, April 20, 28th, 2030. And Jesus says, listen, hey, nobody knows the day or the hour. It'll come like a lightning strike. It'll come like a thief who robs your house. If you knew when the thief was coming, you'd call the police. You'd be ready. But you don't know. It's unknown. I don't know, Jesus says. Only the Father knows. But yet, we find that tons of people spend lots of money and energy, perhaps to make lots of money, on prognosticating when Jesus is going to return. The other response that is common is people say, Ah, he didn't really mean that. It's not going to happen. What are we on, 2020? Yeah, I mean, it hasn't happened yet. And so in the preceding chapter of Matthew's gospel, just before the 10 bridesmaids, we have this story. Jesus, you've heard it before. Jesus says, the master of the house said to his servants, listen, I'm going to go away for a while. You guys are in charge of managing my household, you servants. You guys are all equal. You guys work together, manage the house. But some of the servants said, ah, hey, he's not coming back. So some of the servants, even though they were slaves meant to love one another, started to abuse 
and mistreat the others in the house. In other words, those who were in humility supposed to be followers of the master, who were supposed to be equal servants, became the oppressors, became all the ugly things that they once stood against, all the manipulations of power, all the greed, all the mistreatment of others, all the belittling of those around them, devaluing of others around them. Now that doesn't play in the church today in America. So he tells a second story. The first in Matthew 25. There are 10 bridesmaids, five wise, five foolish. There's a wedding. <clears throat> Curiously, there's no mention of a bride. The bridesmaids all stay at the bride's house, now uh, at, the, at the house that the groom is coming to. Now, in, in early first century weddings, it's common to have a betrothal, so families would arrange, the, either a young man would ask for a woman's hand or the father would arrange the marriage. They would have a contract, a marriage agreement. There would be dowries and, and financial implications as well. But at that point, they're married. The wedding, the, what we would consider a wedding with a bride and groom and the wedding party standing up for an officiation and people being invited, that hasn't happened yet, but they're married already. That's why when Mary is found to be with child, and Joseph is going to divorce her. You say, well, they're not married yet. They're engaged. But legally, they belong to each other. So, all right, the betrothal happens. Then the groom would go live with his father's family. The bride lives with her family. And then on the day set, the groom returns. They all process through town. There's a great celebration. Everybody in town most often is invited. And there's many days of celebration for the wedding. So these bridesmaids are waiting for the wedding. They are waiting at the house for the groom. And they've all brought torches to process through town in the evening and celebrate. Jesus says, and remember, parables, parables have familiar settings, everyday settings, and you're following along the story and you say, uh-huh, 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 this is stuff we know. And then suddenly there's a detail and you say, whoa, what? That's not normal. And in some parables, there's this beautiful uplifting of grace. So we have the prodigal son, you know, father running off the porch. We have the good Samaritan, the lost sheep, where there's this, a, a great feeling of, of, of security and comfort. Some parables are meant to give us comfort and, and powerful grace. Then there are other parables that are meant to trouble us, that are meant to make us wrestle that are just kind of thrown in your lap and you say, there's some tough things that I have to really weigh out. How does my discipleship in following this story, how am I challenged by this? This parable is more the latter than the former. And as the bridesmaids are waiting, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this sermon preached about you know, in verse 13, it says, therefore, be vigilant, stay awake, because nobody knows the day or the hour. And I've heard it preached that way. All right, this, this parable is about staying awake, staying vigilant, staying ready. Well, yes and no. Sure, we're supposed to stay vigilant. But all 10 of these women, both wise and foolish, fall asleep. They don't stay awake. They all, over time, fall asleep all their lamps starting to waver. The groom is very delayed. Finally, somebody at midnight says, the groom is here. They all wake up. They all trim their lamps. So far, the ladies have done everything identically. Now, the foolish ones look at their lamps and they say, oh my gosh, we're not going to have enough oil. We won't make it all the way to the wedding. So they ask, as bridesmaids or groomsmen do at weddings, oh shoot, I forgot whatever, can I borrow some of yours? Can I borrow some of your oil? No. Sorry. We can't give you any of our oil because ours might run out. We'll get to that in just a second. You guys should go. Go and see if you can find some oil before he steps through the door 
And let's just think about this. Who's going out at midnight? And this isn't the age of 24-7 Walmart or grocery stores. Who's going to be selling mid, midnight oil? <laughs> or, you know, late, late, late out. So these women leave. Let's, let's just take a moment there. They've been waiting all this time to meet the groom. Hours. Groom's here. They decide, let's go shopping. Huh? You've been waiting for the groom. The groom is here. But we don't have enough oil. Ah, uh, is that the primary concern here? Or is it meeting the groom, going to the wedding? The story, which seems simple, is not that at all. Some, through the course of time, like Martin Luther said, perhaps the oil represents faith. The wise bridesmaids have their faith in who the groom is. Maybe the foolish don't know the groom in quite the same way. And so they decide their duty to be in the procession, to, to guide the light, is more important. Their, their responsibility, I kind of look at it, the, the Mary Martha text in Matthew, where Martha's, you remember the story, Martha's cooking in the kitchen, Mary's at the feet of Jesus, and Martha says, hey, Lord, tell my sister to get in here and help me out because there's a lot to be done to prepare this meal for you and the disciples. And Jesus says, that's important, but Mary has chosen the better thing. Others have said maybe it's their own salvation. They can't divide it with these ladies because it's their own knowing of the groom. And it, while they could share faith in some level, they can't share that personal relationship with the groom. Others, Richard Swanson, who's also a, another uh, biblical uh, commentary, uh, who is in the UCC uh, Seeds of Faith devotion, says, you know, one of the Jewish customs was that often bridesmaids wanted to both dress beautifully, but also to make sure that they were in that procession because at a lot of times they might have had other suitors looking at them that sometimes happens in weddings today. And so they didn't want to lose their chance of eligibility with other potential young suitors for their own weddings. In any regard, the difference between the wise and the foolish is the oil. And so we have these foolish women going off to buy oil and the wise ones go with the groom. They go to the wedding. There's a wedding celebration, but the door is barred. These foolish women actually do find oil somehow, some way. They come back. They're knocking on the door. Let us in. Let us in. We got our oil. Well, it's too late now, but we've got the oil. We want to come into the, to the wedding. And here is probably one of the most haunting. That's why I said some, some parables are very comforting. Some you really wrestle with. Some you, wow. Jesus, or the, the, the groom, comes to the door and says, I never knew you. Sorry. Can't come in. Wow. I say it's troubling because on two levels, we have this situation where you think, all right, the foolish ones have not brought enough, or they didn't bring any extra oil. They didn't plan ahead, all right? So it's kind of like a scout, a boy scout, or a soccer mom who, who goes on an outing, and you know, they, they, bring, they bring rain gear just in case it rains. They, they make sure that they have band-aids in case somebody gets hurt. They've got a flashlight for the nighttime, and somebody forgets. And so these five wise ones who have been over-prepared, prepared for the long haul, have got an extra flask of oil. The other ones didn't bring any except for the what is in their torch. And you'd think, well, can't these girls share? Isn't there enough to go around? Where is the grace between the bridesmaids? And then the groom shuts the door because these bridesmaids have gone off to get oil 
to make sure the procession was nice, and now they're late for the wedding. But wait a minute, time out. Wasn't the groom hours late already? He can't cut them a little slack. So on the one hand, you think, where is the grace in this parable? It doesn't seem a very graceful parable. The door's shut. There's a finality. There's a judgment here. And so what do we make of this kind of troubling development with the foolish? It's not the first time Matthew has told us a parable of Jesus that has a wise and foolish component. If you go back to Matthew 7, Jesus says, there are some who are wise builders. They build on solid rock this foundation of where they're going to live. And others say, well, there's some beachfront property. It's right on the edge of a cliff there. It's a little bit sandy, but I'm going to put my house there because the view's fantastic. But he says, once the rain comes and the wind and erosion, that house will fall. Foolish, don't build on something that's going to last. And not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I think, wow. So there's this, this warning, as we heard the parable just pre, pre, uh, preceding this one, of not becoming the oppressor. Now the warning seems to be, be careful on how you're building if you're just short-sighted short-term versus being in this for the long haul. Being, thinking about who God is, not just in the moment or a quick fix, um, it almost reminds me of those, you know, the parable of the sower, the seeds that take root just for a moment, but they are in the sun. They're not deeply rooted, so they dry out. And there's this idea in Matthew's gospel that unless you're kind of grounded for the long stretch, no matter what happens, and this idea of having this deepened relationship with the groom. The other thing that I kind of struggle with or, or that wrap my head around in this parable as, as these wise, as a, I'm sorry, as the foolish bridesmaids are left out, again and again in the parables, whether it's the sheep and the goats, which will be coming in a couple weeks, or the, the wedding banquet where people refuse the invitation, it seems to be that Matthew is warning disciples, you have choices in life. And in these choices that you make, whether with your peers and how you treat them, or how you respond to God in your own life, matters. And it's not that God, as I've said before in previous sermons on Matthew's gospel, is there like, a divine traffic cop just waiting to write you a ticket for being illegally parked and waiting to get you. But it's humanity that's doing the choosing. And in, in the cases where they're choosing things that are taking them further away from the groom, further away from one another, further away from the good news and the kingdom that is meant to be. All that said, I will say that this is one of the most troubling parables of Jesus that I, own, I struggle with myself because it has that definitive kind of door slammed in their face. And I think, well, wait a minute. These women, they show up for the wedding. It's not like they ignored the invitation. They want to be there. They want to be in the procession. They make the extra effort to go out and get extra oil to come back. When they come to the wedding, they're pounding on the door, please let us in. And so I really struggle with this parable on a lot of levels. Is it that Matthew's community, Matthew's speaking a word of warning to his community in that time as they've seen all these terrible things happen Really, their world turned upside down and Jerusalem destroyed, the temple gone, everything that they have had that they've connected with their faith, and some of them are just saying, all right, I'm out. And they start to walk away. We don't have any more oil. We don't have any more faith. And you hear this sometimes when you hear 
uh, our fellow brothers and sisters in Judaism, some of them who have survived the Holocaust. Now many of them are now dead, unfortunately, but the survivors, and some of them talking about how the Holocaust deepened their faith, and some of them how it made them lose their faith in God because of what the darkness that humanity was capable of. And is it more a parable speaking to that dynamic that humanity experiences and pleading for the community to hang on, stick it out, hold in there no matter what you face? This is a parable that I still wrestle with mightily. I had a church member uh, after a Bible study say, perhaps, and, and this is, a, is a, and a perspective I had not heard before, but I, I think it's a beautiful one. Perhaps these foolish wanted to have a relationship with the bridegroom but had these self-doubts. They had all the reasons why they weren't good enough and that kept them outside looking in, kept them from experiencing the wedding. It's, it's a different perspective. But when I hear the words, I never knew you, I think if there's anything that should kind of shake us to the core, the idea that, that Jesus would say, and later again to the sheep and the goats, get away from me, I don't recognize you. So that final culmination of thinking about who is it that we seek to be in Christ, not just today, but every day moving forward, no matter what we face. And again, I say, on some levels, this parable in my mind's eye is the perfect parable for this moment in pandemics, in national discord, in uh, some of the, the, the dissonance in the world right now, and saying, hang in there. From where does your help come? It's not from one party, not from one leader, not even from the healthcare that's working on getting rid of the pandemic with vaccines. No, your help from, comes from God. Your promises are in God. So stay with it. Keep those lamps burning. And in the wrestling, know that God is with you. At the end of this journey, even when you can't see it at this moment, is the promise that the kingdom has arrived. The groom is here. Hallelujah. Amen.